Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure for us in another episode of the Tennis Talk, Coaches and Leader Voices, to have a great leader with us. It's Dr. Anne Quinn. Hi, Anne. Hi, Fernando, and hi, everybody. Lovely to be here today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anne, to be with us. It's a privilege for us. Our project is about to create a bridge between top leaders like you and also with tennis people. It's a very important to bring awareness and knowledge and understand more what it takes to be a high performing person. And you did and you are doing a lot about it. Let me introduce a little bit for our, our audience about you. Dr. Ryan Queen is one of the leader and most experienced peak performance specialists in the world. He was working in tennis and many, many other sports areas and industry. Her clients have won more than 60 Grand Slams and nine gold medalists. He has a degree, she has a degree in psychology, exercise physiology, biomechanics, nutrition, and human development. She traveled a lot for many years on the ATP and WTA circuit. She was the director of the health business in uh, Nick Voluntary Academy, who used to be in the past, now is IMG, uh, mm -hmm. working also with many, many top players like Pat Rafter, Pat Cash, Hannah Mandiklova, and many others. She was director of the coach education for Tennis Australia. She was member also of many, many top comedy with the ITF on WTA, helping to develop our game. She wrote many books and also received multiple awards like the ITF service to the game in coaching and also the gold medal from the Australian sports. Actually, doing a lot of projects, she is working also with a big champion. Uh, he's, she is working with Shingo Kunieda from Japan, a multiple uh, Grand Slam winner, and more important, she's doing a lot for our sport and is an international tennis leader. Thank you very much to be with us, Anne. And um, of course, this is a brief introduction because you, you did a lot of different projects and uh, achievements to mention. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Fernando. It's really uh, great to be here today and I'm sure we can hopefully inspire many more coaches and, and players as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that's related with my first question because which is more personal. Let me ask you, who is Anne Queen? Okay, we go straight in the deep end. <laughs> well, all my life I've been really passionate about just helping people to be the best that they can be. It's just been a passion of mine to help people be like my little catchphrase is be extraordinary. And, and I guess it started right from the, um, when I first year of university, we had, we got thrown in the deep end and had to do a hundred hours field work experience. And I chose, mm -hmm. and it's being my sport that I loved. I uh, chose tennis coaching and I was lucky enough to work with a um, a great coach called Ian Barclay. And at the same time, I got uh, asked to come back to my old school and just to be an assistant physical education teacher. And teaching back at my old school, like half the kids don't really like sport. So you'd spend your time disciplining kids and, and then you'd go to coaching and the, the kids just couldn't wait to see you. They were so excited. They really wanted to be coached. And so I quickly differentiated at that early age that I'd rather be coaching than teaching. And um, and then Ian it was is an amazing coach and and has been for a for a long time. And he had not only, you know, all the young kids just starting out and beginners, but he had, you know, all the most a lot of national champions in Australia. Mm -hmm. And so I got the opportunity to work with a lot of great kids and I soon realized that I really loved working with those that were really good because I wanted to find out ways to help them to be even better. And so that's been my passion to work out how can I, you know, help others be the best that they can be. And I guess, you know, for me as a person, you know, I'm, I'm just totally committed to everything I do. I, I'll do whatever it takes. I'm a hard worker and I, I just, you know, I really care about, the the people that I work with and and I guess I've, that's been driven by a great thirst to learn and and you know do whatever it takes to help understand them and get to know them and be the best that they can be and I think 
you know, the greatest, the greatest gift is that we as coaches can give our kids is to believe in themselves and have that confidence within them that they can do whatever it takes. And so that's really been, you know, part of my mission, you know, to, to give that to, to other players that they can achieve their dreams and, and never, ever give up. Yeah, and I'm uh, and, and related on that because uh, you did a great transformation in yourself. You know, you evolve a lot. You did work with different tennis organization, top countries. You did, uh, you work a lot. How was that evolution? How was your transformation and that journey? Well, as I said, it started out with Ian Barclay, where I was five years as his assistant coach while I was going through university. Mm -hmm. And I was so driven to like, be the best I could be so I'm going back into the early 80s and there was no internet then so I wrote 300 letters by hand around the world to top coaches and and academies and I thought you know I'd love just to go and work alongside these people find out what they are doing and and just see for myself so I could learn because you know with no internet back then you couldn't you had no idea what facilities were like and you'd see great pictures in tennis magazines mm -hmm. and so I thought I'll go for a year And uh, anyway, those 300 letters turned into 70 jobs and I finished up my one year turned into five years, you know, traveling and, and living around the States and Europe and, and seeing what the best coaches were doing. And uh, by the end of my first year, I um, got offered the job as health and fitness director at Nick Volateri's. And so suddenly I was doing my dream job at, you know, yeah, Nick, exactly. so many great um, players so suddenly you're you're working with a lot of the players that are already in the top 10 in the world and I thought this is just brilliant and I, I absolutely loved it and I was doing all the physical training then and that had been my focus I really wanted to you know help develop the fitness and the movement and the agility and everything like that and so um, working with a lot of the top players through Nick I soon realized that like I need I wanted to be the best that I could be to help them. And so I felt like I need to to continue to learn more. And so I then went on and did a master's degree and mm -hmm. I started off at the University of Kentucky because I got offered a college coaching position. I thought, okay, that'll help me get more um, experience as a tennis coach. But I realized too that um, it's actually my master's degree is the most important thing. So I transferred to University of Illinois. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky enough to work with, with Jack Rockle. And so Jack was an amazing teacher. And I'd done biomechanics at, um, in my undergraduate. And I, to be honest, I didn't like it. It was like, it was all the physics and nothing was applied. Whereas working with Jack, it was very much applied. He's so yeah. into tennis. Yeah. So everything's tennis related. So, you know, it was brilliant and I loved it. And Also, in my master's degree at University of Illinois, uh, we had to do subjects outside, you know, exercise physiology and biomechanics. So I chose sports psychology. And I was lucky enough that the, uh, the lecturer, the teacher there was Dan Gould. And Dan is absolutely like a brilliant, brilliant teacher. And I absolutely fell in love with sports psychology. And I'd, again, I'd done undergrad psych in my first degree, but again, it wasn't related to sport. They didn't bring it alive. And so working with great teachers that inspired you, that made it really applicable to athletes was, was just brilliant. And so then um, towards the end of my master's degree, I get a phone call from Pat Cash. And, and Pat at the time, Pat was one of Ian's young kids. And Pat was 463 in the world at the time. And he said to me, I'm in hospital. I can't walk. I've got to start from scratch. I really want to make it in tennis. Can you help me? And Ian, his coach, was like another father to me. And I just, like, I, I said, I'd absolutely love to help out. And I said, but I live here now. I live in America. I can't just, you know, come back to Australia. And so he came over. And I really saw it as just a few weeks, you know, or a few months work to get him back on track and get him back into fitness again. But that that few weeks turned in or a few months turned into the next 10 years of my life. And so, you know, back in, this is about going back now to 1986. And so he couldn't afford to take a coach or anything with him. And so he asked me to come along with him for the rest of that year. And, you know, I was just a student. I said, look, I'm happy just to come along and, and I'll do whatever it takes and I'll help you and I'll be there for you all the time. And I did that. And, um, He, they finished up, he got called up for the Australian Davis Cup team. And so he then brought me back to Australia. This is the end of 86. And he won the, uh, or he won all three matches in the, uh, in the Davis Cup, which meant they won, you know, the Davis Cup, which was brilliant. And then a matter of only a few weeks later, 
he came mm-hmm. runner up in the Australian Open. So suddenly, you know, from 463 in the world that we started out with back in, you know, March or April of that year, he was, you know, runner up in a Grand Slam. And I, at this stage, lived away from Australia for four or five years and I uh, I came back and so suddenly, you know, I was the woman behind the man and I had a lot of um, publicity and next thing I know, I've got the Australian cricket team, I've got a national football team, I've got right ski Olympic Olympic um, athletes in all different sports coming to me and I was like, oh my God, I've got my dream business. And so that's that's really how it all started. And I was focused on the training. I was focused on very much on movement. Um, and I'd also continued to study as, along the way and, and done a nutrition uh, degree in that as well. And so, but my my first love was always tennis, you know, and that's, um, and after Pat's success, he said to me, he said, well, you know, I want you to come with me, you know, travel with me full time. And this is back in the, um, in the days when no one had teams, you know, they just had their coach. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, you know, Pat, Nav, Martina Navratilova was probably the first person to have a team around her mm-hmm. and Pat was probably the first guy to have a team around him. And, you know, back in those days, it was, um, you know, to me, I was like, I was doing something I loved. And I was working, you know, we had, uh, you know, Ian Barclay, myself and Pat, and we were traveling and it was, it was fabulous. I loved every minute I'll be there the whole time. And again, you know, as, as time moved on, you know, I got asked to help other players. Um, and so I finished up, you know, with Pat Rafter, Todd Woodbridge, Nicole Provis, Hanuman Lakova, you know, lots of different players. And as a result of that journey, I got frustrated because, you know, you knew that they were capable of mm-hmm. beating anyone on, on their day. And so, you could see it was actually their mindset that was holding them back. It was the the pressure, the worries, the tension. It was like, and so I wanted to be able to help them. And you understood their world. You under, you were there with them 24-7. You understood what was going on. And, you know, that really led me going to study psych. So I actually went back and did another five years at university and did a, um, a PhD in clinical psychology. And so, you know, because I wanted to be, the person that could help them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, and so I, you know, combined all those things. I was already, I guess, a natural motivator. And it's when you know an athlete so well, you know what to say and when to say it. And uh, and so after 15 years of uh, traveling on the tour, you know, living, and that's one thing, you know, when you come from Australia away, you know, nine or 10 months of the year. So they're long years. And Um, I finished up taking the job as National Director of Coach Education for Tennis Australia. Yep. And that was great because obviously um, I was putting in all my uh, experiences, not only from a coaching perspective, but also from the sports science perspective. And back then it was only me running coach education. So it was a huge job trying to, uh, you know, get out and get around to all the states in Australia and educating coaches and and helping them to, uh, you know, to educate them and, and educate them in all areas of tennis. Um, and so that I did that for four years. And then what happened, I had, my dad had a stroke. And so suddenly I actually had to resign because he, dad had a business with 70 employees and they all would have lost their jobs. And so suddenly I got thrown in the deep end and next thing I'm running a, a furniture manufacturing. <laughs> <laughs> Change your jobs, absolutely. <laughs> so totally, totally change of um, of jobs. And it was, to be honest, I didn't like it. I hated it. It was just not my passion. I was taken out of doing everything that I loved into doing something that I had no idea about. And, and you know, like I did it. Like obviously family is the most important thing. And that's what, you know, that's what I did for my family, for my dad. And, and um, so I did that for the next two years uh, to help dad out until we sold the business. And then uh, a couple of years later, I got, um, I was lucky enough to get the job as head of sports science at British Tennis. Yeah. And that was, you know, a brilliant, um, a brilliant job. It's like they had the whole new facility had just been built at Roehampton. So you got, I was involved in the early stages of setting up that facility. Uh, So I did that for several years. That was managing a team of 30 people. And so again, you've got your sports medicine, you had your fitness and conditioning, your nutrition, your psychology, all the aspects. So that was fantastic. Uh, and again, I returned to Australia at the end of 2012 because my, uh, again, my dad had a, was not well at all. And so I thought, you know, I'm the only child. So my mum had passed away a long time. So it was, again, 
family reasons and, and taking care of my dad. So I did that and looked after him until he passed away. And then I went back to, you know, consulting for myself and I've been doing that ever since. And, and my focus now is, is much more on the, uh, on the mental side of the game, Yeah, but I still do a lot. And I was, you know, doing five or six trips a year pre COVID. Um, so yeah, it's still very heavily involved and love it. Yeah, absolutely. Let, let me let me tell you, Anne, that uh, next month in November, mm -hmm. Jack Gropel and Pat Cash will be in our show, which oh, is a <laughs> total coincidence. But there anyway, <laughs> it's it's part exactly. of the the same pathway that we are doing, not to show to have a voice to the leaders. Yes. Uh, let, let me ask I you, Anne. <laughs> sorry, you've got great people you're getting, so that's fantastic. Yeah, let, let me ask you about your leadership and coaching principles because you create a big relationship with player with teams and also with the organization let me ask you which are the key principles that you apply when you are leading a team and you know trying to develop a project you know something i think people that are great leaders people that are extraordinary leaders they lead by example they lead with their their energy their passion you know they have this grand vision and they take people with them, you know, they take people with them with their massive actions. And I think, you know, it's, they paint the picture, you know, it's like with some athletes, for example, maybe they don't believe that they're capable of winning a grand slam, but, you know, a great coach, a great leader will inspire them, will, will make them see that it's possible. In fact, I was just listening to um, Louis Kay's podcast yeah. and, you know, as he, and as well it's like it's you know we as coaches leaders we can sometimes see much further than the athlete can see and so it's actually painting the picture showing them what it takes to take every step along their way and and you know that part of that is like taking them out of their comfort zone making them see what's possible but making sure that they enjoy the journey and they have fun along the way and you know it's setting very clear goals and then what are the what a you know the I like to give rewards along the way you know and and reward that massive effort that they're doing so and it's enjoying the journey that's really key but again yeah. I think it's the energy and the passion that um, that really makes extraordinary leaders yeah uh, absolutely and I'm talking about because you are a great leader you like I I say before you uh, did a lot of achievements and, and different kind of projects. Uh, you help coaching, which is one of the purposes of this project, to change paradigms. Let, let me ask you about which consider your key values in terms when you create a relationship. Which are the key aspects that you uh, put like a principles and value to establish this kind of relationship? Well, when you're working with someone, you want to really you want to get to know them. Do you know what I mean? You want to know what it is that's really important to them. And I think it's, you know, we're all unique and it's understanding what, what's really important to that person. Mm -hmm. You know, what's it going to take to bring out the best in that person and knowing how they work. So it's really, you know, I want to know that the values that they've got, are, you know, obviously, you know, honesty, integrity and respect, yeah. all those things are really important, but it's, you want to know, that they're going to work really hard. I want to know that they're going to give it everything. I want to know that they're going to be passionate and they've got a great attitude. And it's like every yeah. setback along the way, every challenge along the way is going to lead them. You know, that's all part of the, the lessons we take in life. So you're looking for things about their, their ethic, their commitment, their dedication. How much are they going to persevere? Are they going to give it their everything? And, and do they really want to love to learn? Because I think all the great um, athletes that I've worked with in all different sports, they ask fantastic questions. They want to know why, and that's what I love. It's not just it's not just telling them. It's it's actually you know they want to understand. I think that's important for us as coaches, as leaders, to not just tell our athletes, but to ask great questions of them so that they yeah. continue to learn and they work it out for themselves. So you know it's that that passion you know they've got to have that passion they've got to have that attitude they've got to be positive and and you know I think one of the things is it's just being you know I love to really care about the person you know it's not about the it's not about the win or the loss it's actually about the person and, and it's you know as we know tennis is like a game of life and yeah. as 
coaches, you know, we've got that responsibility to help our, our players navigate through life. So it's teaching them along the way. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and uh, let me ask you about, because you did work with champions like Pat Cash, like Raptor, mm -hmm. which they, they, they were uh, in a position to win Grand Slams, but also they face different kind of big champions. And also you probably uh, have some consideration about Djokovic, Nadal, Federer, all those kind of champions. What do you consider there are... The, they are different, how they behave, how they think, why they are such a level of champions. Yeah, they, they think, you know, it's interesting. It's like, it's, they, they really, um, they think outside the box. And so, for example, I'll give you, I'll talk about Shingo, for example, who I've been with on a 16 year journey. Um, and I started with him before he'd won one Grand Slam. He just won his 50th Grand Slam this year. And so it's one thing to get to number one, but to stay at to number one is actually much, much tougher. And everyone is always studying you and they're finding out ways to beat you. And they, you know that they're looking at every little detail. Yep. But what I really admire about Shingo is like, he's always asking great questions. He's always looking at what can I do to be better? What do I need to change? How can I adapt my game? So he's continually evolving. It's like, you know, last year, um, Last year he lost first round of Wimbledon, and um, you know he. So what did what did he do? He wanted to find out. Okay, what do, you know? It's the one one tournament I need to win. What do I need to do to win on grass? And um, so he went and asked Roger Federer. You know, can you give me some advice good. about how to play on grass? It's Where like, is you know, <laughs> Yeah, you you go to the best person, and that's exactly what he did. And it's like you know, and Roger gave him some great advice. In fact, even um, this year when when Shingo won Wimbledon for the first time, he actually thanked Roger Federer for his great advice. And that was, you know, and it, it is great advice. It was like, you've got to keep attacking. You've got to be aggressive. Don't worry about losing points. Just go get focused on the next point straight away. So again, great advice. And they always find out a way to continue to evolve, to continue to do things differently. And I think as coaches as well, you know, I look back on, you know, the way you started out as a coach and what you did, you evolved so much over each year, you're always continuing to learn. I think for all of us, whether as you're a coach, you're a player, it's continuing to learn, to evolve, to be the best that you can be. But it's also, it's staying focused on the routines that work for you. So for example, like, you know, people think Nadal might be a little bit over the top with all his routines and yeah. everything's got to be in the right place, but that's part of his success. And, I, you know, it's, I say to a lot of players, a lot of the mental routines that I would help players with, they're easy to do. They're really easy to do, but they're also easy not to do. And people think, oh, yeah, I've got it. I'll use it only when I need it. But the key to success is actually doing it day in, day out, every single day. And I think that's, you know, it's the little differences that make the big difference. And it's, it's, it's really getting to know what are the little differences for each player that's going to determine what will make the, you know, make the difference for them between ordinary and extraordinary. Yeah, absolutely. But it's the same for uh, any people, no? because you are a high performing person. And mm -hmm. also you did work with, like you say before, firstly is the person, then the tennis player of the coach. Mm -hmm. let, let me ask you about coaches because we have an audience coaches from all of the all over the world following the top coaches the top leader like you in this case uh what do you think has to be the values of the coach let's say a coach is which is working in any country and he wants to develop junior player which probably in the future could uh become a champion a professional tennis player which are the mm -hmm. key values to develop like a coach you know, for coaches, I think you've got to have that passion. You've got to be energized. And so it's always wanting to learn. So I think, you know, a lot of coaches, you know, they'll go and do their coach education work, but it's like it doesn't stop there when you've done your coach education courses. Mm -hmm. It's continuing to learn. And, you know, whether that be by going to um, going to watch great players play, going to, you know, talk to other coaches, attending, you know, attending different conferences, um, it's it's actually 
it's never ever stopping learning you know it's like um and I think it's also being positive uh and being positive with your players like I've had you know a few a few players have said to me over the years it's like you know they're in the middle of a match and they're fighting and they're losing but they look up to their coach in the stands and that you know the coach might not be saying anything but it's like the way they're sitting can be you can tell that they're disappointed or they're not happy and it's like as a coach I think we really want to be just totally supporting our player no matter what so it's like being there and being positive all the time especially when they're struggling they're in the trenches they're fighting and I think you know if I look back on my career that that I spent 12 years at university but the greatest teachers have been my athletes and I think as a coach, you need to learn to listen to the player, you know, ask great questions. You know, we can teach, I think we can better yeah. teach them as I said, by asking questions so they work it out for themselves. It's like, you've got to get them to problem solve because they're the ones that are going to have to be solving the problems um, out on the court, you know, when the pressure's really on. And I think another thing for coaching too is a coach always must be prepared. And so, you know, I'll give you an example in point, like for the Olympics just gone, it's like, you know, we had to have contingency plans in, pre in, in, in place for, well, what if your coach gets COVID and mm -hmm. you can't be with the coach? You know, it's like, what are you going to do? <laughs> it's, you know, it's again, it's preparing for every possible scenario. So I remember hearing um, Michael Phelps' coach uh, give a talk one time and, you know, he would do things like take, his goggles away from him, you know, before a, before a training session so, or a meet. So he, he learned how to prepare for something that could really totally throw you. So again, it's, you know, it's always thinking outside the box, continuing to evaluate your player, to evaluate them technically, tactically, physically, mentally, yeah. you know, recovery, sleep, every possible thing. What are they doing for their, you know, relaxation? So, you know, it's, it's looking at every aspect of their performance. And I think, and the other thing I'd say too for um, for helping coaches to be great leaders is just to really believe in them, believe in your players. You know, you believing in that player, like they're going to look up to you more than they'll look up to your parents. They will, you know, parents, Absolutely. they'll know exactly what to say, but it's the coach that they'll look up to. And so you're in such a a powerful role as a coach to really influence and to really inspire and make such incredible differences in our lives. And so, you know, it's, it's an amazing position to be in because you can really make such a powerful difference in the lives of your player. So I think that's, you know, being positive and energized and passionate and believing in your players is a great yeah. gift that you can give them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, like you say, you know, more, more information, brings more transformation no you put the passion yeah. to do that and mm -hmm. and how how you manage because you you were working with uh, tennis australia like a coaching director and, and also you did work a lot of coaching helping many many different organizations you published many books uh, you know uh, about mm -hmm. it and last 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 month we had also jim lur we spoke about you also it's like a you know it's a, a very uh, positive environment that we need to keep learning, keep growing in our sport. How to break down the comfort zone sometimes for coaches? Because sometimes coaches are used to do the same for 10 years and the, the world, the knowledge, you know, the innovation is evolving a lot. How we can break down that? For them to continue to learn and things yeah. you mean? Or... Yeah. Well, you've got to look at, um, like I think today there's so many like great podcasts like this one and and there's so many great opportunities to learn and especially like on on the internet and everything and I think you've got to be discerning about or like I would say to people be discerning about what you listen to because there's so many things out there but it's like make sure that you're you know you're listening to someone that's got you know got track records that's got the you know that you know that background that you know and someone that inspires you it's finding out what what is it that you need to do? What 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 are your areas that you would need to brush up on as a coach? Where do you think you could get better? You know, it's like it's, you know, yeah. Alcaraz suddenly, you know, brought back like the, the drop shot and, you know, all the kids want to learn out how to do a better drop shot. It's like, yeah. it's always like looking at things as what can I do to grow as a coach? And it's like, 
you know, I, as I said, I went off and traveled and, and I continue to travel. And so you get to, to meet lots of coaches, you get to talk and you get to brainstorm. And that's, that's often you can go to conferences, but the learning is in the conversations between the sessions. It's learning and asking questions and discussing. And I think it's, it's, if you can go to other sports as well, I think um, that's really helped me as a coach. Uh, so for example, I had a, a boxer that asked me to train him and I you know, immediately I said, look, I don't know anything about boxing. I'm not sure I'm the right person to help you. But, you know, I got in the deep end. I went and had boxing lessons. I got in the ring. I learned boxing. And, but it's like, you know something? I got the gifts of, you know, learning so much from my tennis players because learning, you know, quick hands, quick feet, reaction time, response time. It's like, oh, my exactly. God, these are fantastic, fantastic attributes to, to develop for tennis players. And so I got all my tennis players in the boxing ring. But again, so it's actually thinking outside the box because so you're continually to be inspired. Like it's, you know, when you're day in and day out on the tennis court developing players, it's like you've got to look for inspiration for you. And, you know, I would say there's no substitute for getting out and traveling, going to visit other facilities, other places. You know, if you can go to some big tournaments, it's getting courtside. It's one thing to watch pro players on TV, but actually being courtside and seeing, you know, seeing the you know their faces seeing how hard they're training seeing exactly what they're doing is really really helpful but even yeah. just watching watching too you know like last year I was forced to you know you're forced to you well here in Melbourne we we're in lockdown for almost two years and so when you watch things on TV sometimes you see things from a different perspective and you'll see you know you look into their face and their eyes and their little movements so you'll pick up on a lot of things there so I think it's it's reading, listening, learning, talking, discussing. They're all things that we need to do as coaches to continue to, you know, to learn. Yeah, this is one of the key aspects. What we try to do is the, to create a sharing culture, no? to open up, like you say, you know, to have an open mind, to learn a lot about many people and different mm -hmm. disciplines. Uh, and, and talking because you study a lot, you study in mm -hmm. different areas. Uh, you have a, like an integral approach, you know, you can bring psychology, physiology, nutrition, biomechanics, mm -hmm. you know, you have mm -hmm. a, a real sports science approach, how it works. Yes. Let's say you, you're going to work with a player, you are taking a look in different areas, the approach is more holistic, let's say. Mm -hmm. Well, it, that depends, everyone's different, um, because they've all, like now it's different with people, because they've all got their their coaching team behind them whether it's a professional player and so you know you don't want to you know they've also got a yeah. most of them have got a full-time physical trainer they've also got a physiotherapist a lot of them have got a physiotherapist team with them and so uh, it's actually listening to what are the what are the things that they want you know how can I best help them it comes down to what they really want and what they're looking for so again it's it's getting to know the person really well and understanding what it is they want but when you go into a team situation, it's getting to know every other members of the team, mm -hmm. you know, so it's taking time to get to know the player and what they want, what's important to them, what, you know, and just spending time observing, you know, you can do lots of evaluations and different things like that. So if it was from a physical perspective, you do all the evaluations in detail. Um, from a technical perspective, you do all that, but often that's usually the role of the coach. So I don't like standing on the, on the toes of the coach. It's like letting them do that. But it, again, you can inspire um, or you can put you know, suggestions forward, different ways of looking at things, but mm -hmm. making sure that they take care of everything. So it's they might be doing things technically, tactically, physically, and mentally, but are they taking care of their sleep, for example? What are they doing for their recovery? You know, recovery is so critical today yeah. for every player. And, you know, people think, oh, yeah, I'll just do an ice bath after, um, you know, after I finish my match and that takes care of my recovery. But it's like it's recovery after a Grand Slam tournament. You know, you're giving absolutely everything of yourself. You know, it's like, you know, Alcaraz after the, you know, the US Open and going and playing tournaments, you know, Davis Cup straight away. It's like it's mentally, physically, emotionally, you know, it's taking all of you. And I think, you know, you need to take time out just to to do nothing, to chill, to relax, to go back to, you know, do whatever you want to do, whether it's being in yeah. nature or time with your family. But it's like, 
it's looking at all aspects of performance. So my role would be to like get to understand the player and and what's going to best help them and then doing all the analysis depending on what area they need. But it's making sure that every aspect of performance is taken care of because there's always room for improvement. No matter where you're at, and even if you're number one in the world, it's like, okay, what else can we do to improve? Yeah, of course. If we you can do 1% per day, it's an improvement, mm -hmm. no? Yeah, make it absolutely. Huge difference. That would be and, major. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. And how it works with Jingo, Shingo, uh, because mm -hmm. he is a great performer, and a great competitor, you know, but also different culture. How was that adaptation and to understand the different culture, but also to be competitive in the international field? Yeah, so with Shingo, um, you know, one of the difficulties that that um, happened when we started was that he didn't speak a word of English. And so everything was had to be through an interpreter. So that, again, that's another challenge um, when you're working with a player that doesn't speak, you don't speak the same language. And so you have to be really clear in your communication in those situations. You And sometimes, you, like, you have to have an interpreter that understands tennis yep. because when you talk, talking little technical things and and being very precise with movement and the angle of the racket, you've got to make sure they're communicated properly. So it's communicating um, very clearly with your actions. But with Shingo, um, I was actually up in, in Japan doing some coach education work and they asked me to look at their, you know, have a look at their wheelchair players. And uh, and Shingo was was one person that, you know, said, can you come and look at me? And the only time I can get a court is like five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and so, you know, I got there about quarter to five the next morning, but like he'd already been there at 4.15 warming up. Like he was very passionate, very dedicated, very committed right from the start. And, you know, so when I started with him, like he had a dream. One of the very first questions he said to me, you know, without any, any ranking at all, hardly at this stage, he said, do you think I have the potential to become number one in the world? So everything starts with a dream and he knew what he wanted. And so my role with him started doing, looking at everything. So it, it was looking at technical analysis. So it wasn't mm -hmm. just forehands and backhands, it was backhand approach, backhand topspin, backhand slice. It's like looking and breaking down everything. And you know, the, the Japanese like going by recipes. They like to have very precise things. This is how you do it. And so, you know, I remember saying to him one time, I said, you know, you really, to make a change, you're going to have to do 30,000 shots or 30,000 repetitions. And, you know, he actually tracked that. He actually measured that. He made sure it's like, okay, I'm going to do this many a day and did that. And so, again, a champion, just so committed, so dedicated, so precise in the way he did everything. And so my role with Shingo over the years has changed. Obviously, it was doing all that, you know, the technical side of things and then mm -hmm. doing all the physical side of things. And again, it's it's every aspect of performance. Like I'd already um, coached a wheelchair sprinter uh, who mm -hmm. was a gold medalist in 100, 200 and 400 metres. So I knew what it took in terms of the training load of a wheelchair player. Mm -hmm. And Shingo at the time was doing probably one-tenth of what I said, my my sprinter who only has to go 100 metres is doing 10 times what you're doing. And so, again, it's just it's opening up there, making them realise, painting the picture of what you have to do, of what's possible and to, in order to be your best. And so, you know, over the years, like obviously he's got a full-time coach mm -hmm. and a full-time physio trainer that goes with him now. And so my role um, these days is more around the mental aspects and having known him for, you know, 16 years, it's like, you know what to say and when to say it, you know, you can, I can just tell by looking at him, knowing if he's ready or not ready. It's, and it's, it's committing to do the little things. And it's, you know, as I say, the difference between ordinary and extraordinary is that little extra. And, it, and sometimes it's, you might be doing something, but you're not doing it to the nth degree. So simple thing like breathing, you know, yeah. you can be breathing, but you can breathing and really letting go of tension. You know, it's it's those little things. So, you know, my my role is cha you know changes, and again, it's like we all evolve, and it's like I'm not going to be telling him what to do. He knows what to do. I said, you're the you're the world, you're you're number one in the world. You're a you know the invincible champion. champion. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna I'm not going to tell him what to do. He knows what to do, but it's actually 
just you know being that inspiration being that support providing that just steady energy just to allow him to trust himself to know inside deep within that he can do it is really yeah. what's critical and I'm keep creating that circle of confidence you know that with you you know it's more like a, it's more about energy you know because he has the mm -hmm. clear vision and he is ready to pay the price and l let me ask you and an, which is related with your response about the mm -hmm. communication process you no know, because you mm -hmm are able to manage different kind of roles. How, yes. how important is to understand the communication process, how to listen, how to listen to the player, how is for you? You know, communication is key. It's just absolutely essential. And it's, it's again, it's making sure you really get to know and to understand the person. Like it, it it's hearing what they're saying but also hearing <laughs> what they're not saying and so sometimes just you can you hear what they say but then you read their face and it's like what they're not communicating to you so it's again getting to know and getting to understand the person and being flexible it's like you know just having that you know there's a, there's a time and a place to do and say things and it's you know it's building up that empathy and understanding yeah. with that person and you know you build that confidentiality and trust I think you know as coaches we've got to be you know you've got to be open you've got to be honest but it's also you know the player has got to feel confident with you that you know that they're not going to break their trust and I think it's you know I could have written <laughs> could have written a bestseller many times with a lot of the athletes I've worked with but it's like you never break that trust it's you know it's staying confidential and and being there for them through the toughest of times so that they can they know that you can be that rock for them to um to depend upon so again it comes back to to knowing that person and understanding i think is the key to um great communication yeah and, I, I, and also to understand the kind of sport that we have because it's an individual sport and you have mm -hmm. to deal with the pressure traveling around different food different hotels different culture different environment you know mm. you have to be very adaptable no how how you deal with the pressure of uh because sometimes we have like i said before in our audience a lot of parents of, of people who love tennis and also coaches who probably mm. they have a talent guy you know national champion but it's totally different to have success in the international field you have to be mm. prepared you know, to travel around 30 weeks, different food, not the mm. mom food, you know, it's like a, how to prepare, you know, the junior players for that. And Well, I think it comes back to developing the mental skills. And I think what happens is people learn mental skills and they might only go and have one or two lessons or have a couple of lessons, but actually, you know, 80% of your time in a match is spent not playing points. And so it's actually, you know, I actually, you know, I like to educate people to think of mental skills as it's just as important as, you know, you're doing your, you're not only your, your technical training, not only doing your, you know, your, your tennis training and your, your movement or your physical training and fitness and conditioning, but also you've got to put time in each day to do the mental part because when the pressure is on, yeah. it's the way to respond. I mean, pressure is, pressure is part of playing tennis. That's, you know, it's part of life and, it's the way you look at some things under, under you know, those intense situations. And, you know, as the great Billy Jenkins said, you know, pressure is a privilege. Yeah. You know, it's tennis players, you know, they're playing tennis, they love to compete. And so it's seeing that pressure as, as an opportunity. It's an excitement. It's like, it's when you're nervous, it's like I say, nerves are your friend. It's preparing your body to perform. That's when the pressure is on. You're feeling that because you're getting your, your body's getting ready to perform. Yeah. And so it's sticking in that those times to what is it that makes you play your best? What are your routines that you have in place? And getting back to those routines and never, never stop doing them, no matter what the point score is, you know, so you're not doing anything differently. You know, the reason why, you know, Federer can execute this magnificent backhand down the line. At, I remember like oh, it's 2008 Wimbledon at, you know, at, six all on the, the fifth set or something when it's, you know, getting dark or whatever. It's like they can perform under pressure 
because they've done it over and over again. They they visualize the way they want to play. They they go through every little detail. It's like they focus on the process of what they need to do. Yeah. And I think, you know, for coaches, um, you know, if you're coming through with players, you know, it's, sometimes it's very exciting for coaches. It's like, hey, they've got their kid in the final of a big tournament. You know, it's you controlling your emotions as a coach too because it's actually you being the steady, calm influence and yeah. treating it like another match. Like I've had, you know, I've had uh, coaches get so excited you've had to calm them down or, or you've had to, you know, I've had to say sometimes something to the other members of the team. So it's just it's just like another day. It's just like this is another match and it's just focusing on doing exactly what we do every single time. And for the players, it's getting them to focus on them. You know, they don't, you know, sometimes I think they race their head. It's like, oh, if I win this, I, you know, yeah. it's focusing on the, the they're winning before they've won, actually won. And so it's getting back to focusing on them and not their opponent, you know, focus on what they can control. And, and in that time, they've got to keep talking positively to themselves. I think that's critical. It's like, I know I can do it. I, you know, it's trusting themselves. It's saying whatever they might be saying to themselves that they need to focus on. So they're totally present in the moment and they're taking their time and they're breathing so lots of little strategies in there to you know to do to focus on the process but um for the player but again it's it's knowing that player and and how they respond under pressure and therefore what's the best strategy for them and then practicing yeah no no (laughs) because this is a this is a self-team sport. We need to do that. No, we need to. Yeah. You have to believe in yourself and not only in your, in your player, in yourself as, as a coach also, no? That yes, you can absolutely. do it. But it's a very interesting because we need to change that paradigm. We used to say a lot, this is a, tennis is a mental game, but probably mm-hmm. coaches, they don't practice enough the mental mm-hmm. approach during the training sessions. Yeah, I think that needs to be part of every day. And I think that's something we can do is like help them make it part of every day. It's not something you just go and have a mental lesson and then that's taking care of the mental aspects. It's, it's actually got to be applied to training. It's actually doing it on court. It's like that's that's where it happens. <laughs> and that's, you know, you might learn some things in the classroom, but it's actually getting out in court and doing it. And that's, that's where the coach comes in. It's, it's applying it and setting up drills so they're under pressure to 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 implement that it's like you when you've practiced something and you repeat it over and over and over again it's like i know i can do this i've done it a million times already yeah yeah absolutely Easy to do yeah absolutely and we have a couple more questions i know that we can speak by hours because mm-hmm. we love this game and also we have but before the two questions let me let me ask you a little bit about a couple of days ago Roger Federer uh, did his retirement some impression about what happened the last Friday you know I think like he's just such a an a, such an amazing athlete he's such an amazing person and he has the respect of everybody around him and I think it's great that he can express his emotions and you know like he seeing he and Nadal you know just both crying and just being they're being true and they're being authentic to themselves by just expressing yeah. um and sharing that with the world. I think it's great. You know, it's like a lot of people say, oh, you know, men shouldn't be crying, but it's like they're being true to themselves. They're 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 um, you know, Rod Roger just gave everything of himself to that sport and and really I think it's just a um I just think it was such a, a lovely way for him to to say goodbye. And be in that situation and just feel the love of everybody. It's just admiration and, and respect from everyone. It's, you know, it's a big loss to our sport, but I'm sure he's going to be involved um, for many, many years to come in, in all different ways. But, you know, he's the 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 epitome of sportsmanship, of, um, you know, of the blade of, you know, plays with such grace and, you know, really just admire him. And he's a great role model and yeah, will continue absolutely. to be a great role for for our sport and for all players yeah absolutely it's a great ambassador it's a great king of our sport and yeah uh, um, sometimes people they don't that really don't know how much is the price to be in the top for many many years you know yeah. how many things you have to left no but probably the tears are coming from many things together for many many years yeah. uh, l- let me ask you a couple more questions and 
Like I say, mm -hmm. we can talk by hours with you. Let me talk about, uh, let me, let's talk about a little bit about your many projects that you are doing to develop mm -hmm. human beings because uh, you are doing a lot of contribution. Um, mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about your work. So most of my work right now is doing, I, I love working one-on-one. -on -one. So most of my work is actually doing one-on-one uh, -on -one work with athletes and executives. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's absolutely what I love to do. Uh, perhaps more how I've evolved over the last 10 or 15 years is getting into the power of our subconscious mind. So a lot of the mental skills we develop are, are conscious skills um, that we teach our athletes, but it's actually our real power is in within our extraordinary mind. It's like our, our intuition already yeah. knows all the answers. It knows how to play. It's learning to trust yourself. And that's at a much deeper subconscious level. So I really work a lot on, on teaching people how to, to trust their intuition so they get in that flow state and so they can be truly and authentically themselves. Um, and, you know, for me, that's, you know, I, I love, you know, again, it's about bringing out the best in people. Um, I still travel and I'm on a few boards and different things. So I'm still traveling to, you know, usually a couple of grand slams a year. So like this year, I've been to what Australian, Wimbledon and US. Um, I've got speaking engagements all over the place. And, and I guess one of my things I've done just recently is I've put together a, a confidence mindset for tennis course. So I wanted to be able to get out to a lot more people. So I've just put 11 modules, video modules together of um, teaching people various skills, because I just think the ability to believe in yourself, to have that confidence to go out and play the way you know you can play. Um, that's really, you know, I think that's the greatest gift that we as coaches can give people and that's what I wanted to do is to to educate more people so that's been a my um my focus at this point in time yeah so keep busy <laughs> no no we 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 know your different projects and also all the help you are doing for many many different kind of people last question mm -hmm. and are you enjoying your journey I absolutely love it yeah I do it's like the first thing I do every morning is I just, I give gratitude, you know, I just I give gratitude for being, you know, healthy, happy and, and getting to do what I love each day, you know, whether it be a young junior athlete or player or whether it's a professional player, it's like, I love helping people, you know, chase their dreams and be extraordinary. So it's, yeah, I really love it. And I'm fortunate to be on, on a, a couple of um, boards and panels and that too. So you're getting to brainstorm with, you know, with, professionals and and that are out in the field and and yeah keeping up with everything that's going on so yeah i love my life i'm very happy <laughs> thank you very much and to be in our episode was a privilege and honor for us thank you very much for all the things that you did for tennis you are doing for mm -hmm. tennis but more you're gonna do for our sport oh thank you very much fernando and it's, look it's been a great honor to be here and share this journey and Thank you for all the work that you're doing and the, you know, the help to inspire, you know, both players and coaches all over the world. So, you know, thank you for that too, for your thank contribution. You. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. And, and thank you for our partners, uh, GPTCA, Tennis One, uh, Segal Institute. But more important, thank you to you because we want to create a bridge with top leaders like Anne and you because we want to bring awareness and knowledge and more grow to our sport. Thank you very much and see you next time with another episode of the Tennis Talk Coaches and Leaders. I am Alberto Castellani, President of GPTCA, Global Professional Tennis Coach Association. Learn from the best ATP coaches in the world. I hope that at the end of this course you will learn a lot of things. I hope that I will see you on the circuit with your player. This is the goal.